Welcome to Discussing Bach, the multimedia publication produced by Bach Network. My name is Ruth Tatlow, and I am co-editor with Barbara Royal of this issue, Bach and Jesus. I'm delighted to welcome Robin Lever, Noel Heber, and Michael Marison as our three experts, who over the next 30 minutes or so, will be sharing new research ideas and opening up this deep and complex topic for us. Without further ado, I will hand over to Robin to start the ideas rolling with a presentation on emblematic Jesus. Receiving communion during Bach's time was not as frequent as it is now. For example, the records of the Thomas Church in Leipzig reveal that Bach usually received communion only two or three times each year, sometimes only once. Participation in the Lord's Supper was regarded as a solemn obligation that had to be taken very seriously. In particular, one had to be prepared for this encounter with Jesus. Each individual had to commit to a succession of personal daily prayers for at least a week before receiving communion, and then during the following week to meditate on the significance of having received communion. Then on the day before communion, after Saturday Vespers, it was necessary to make individual confession to one of the clergy, the Beichtvater, the Father Confessor, privately in a separate confessional, a Beichtstuhl within the, within the church. This Lutheran practice of individual private confession, which was discontinued by the 19th century, was supported by devotional handbooks for confession and communion small duodecimo volumes that could easily fit into a man's pocket or a woman's handbag. The books were often written by parish clergy and published by local printers, but a few had much wider circulation, being reprinted numerous times by different printer publishers, encompassing a wide geographical area and over a long period of time. One of the most significant was the Confession Communion Prayer Book by Johann Rittmeier. The title, Heavenly Joyful Supper for the Children of God on Earth, or Spiritual Prayers that are Nourishing to be Used Before, During, and After Confession and Communion. Rittmeier was a pastor and professor in Helmstedt, and his devotional book, first published in 1683, became the most popular handbook of practical devotion for confession and communion over the next hundred years or so in Lutheran Germany. Between 1683 and 1779, almost 50 different extant editions were published, but it's likely that there were other editions of this popular book that have, been sub that have subsequently disappeared or are in private hands and therefore are unrecorded. The distinctive feature of Rittmeyer's Confession Communion Prayer Book is the sequence of 10 emblematic copper engravings, which illustrate the presence of Jesus in the life of the individual, Jesus in the heart. What is intriguing about these images is that they are adaptations of a sequence of 18 engravings by Anton Wirix, the younger, a member of the distinguished family of, of Flemish artists, that were published around 1600 under the title Cor Jesu Amante Sacrum, the heart devoted to the loving Jesus. The sequence of images were either prepared for or commissioned by the, the Catholic Jesuits. Uh, on the title page that you see there, on the right, the person that person is a Jesuit priest. Each emblem has no heading, but underneath there is a, a six-line verse in Latin describing the image. During the 17th century, the images were reprinted, re-engraved many, many times, arranged in different sequences with different Latin texts, and were used extensively in the various missionary endeavors of the Jesuits. Rittmeyer, the Lutheran, takes just 10 of these emblems and reinterprets them for the Lutheran practice of confession and communion and inserts them into his devotional handbook 
in appropriate places. He also gives each emblem a heading, a relevant biblical verse above the image, and an explanatory four-line verse below it, all in German, not in Latin. And so we can go through the sequence. First, Jesus knocks at the heart. Then Jesus searches throughout the heart, hence the lamp. Then Jesus purifies the heart. Then Jesus sings in the heart. Jesus feeds the heart. Jesus is the source of all grace. Jesus brings the cross into the heart. Jesus prays for us. And then Jesus reigns uh, in us. And then finally, <laughs> quite a staggering one, Jesus plays in the heart, plays music, that is. Now, there are, there are at least three Leipzig connections. First, there is the Leipzig Accursion and Doctrine of 1694, a handbook for confession and communion that has a set of similar Jesus and the Heart engravings. This is significant because the book is a primary source for the details of the Leipzig liturgy. The editor, Gottfried, uh, Gottlob Friedrich Seligman, was the archdeacon of the Thomas Church at the time and later professor of theology. Second, Seligman also produced another de devotional book, Introduction to House and Heart Devotion, published by the same Leipzig publisher in the same year, 1694, clearly the House and Dachten equivalent of the Kirchen and Dachten. This volume also has a similar sequence of Jesus in the Heart engravings that were clearly done by the same anonymous Leipzig engraver who was responsible for the images in the Leipzig Kirchen and Dachten. Third, when the Lüneburg publisher Stern uh, took over publishing the, Rit the Rittmeyer volume uh, in the early 1720s, the images were re-engraved by the Bruhls of, of Leipzig. So there is a strong possibility that Bach was aware of such images, especially as these heart emblems gave rise to other engravings, such as the one in, in an edition of Heinrich Muller's Himmlische Liebeskus, a book that Bach, uh, we know that Bach uh, uh, owned. Now, given the Luther Lutheran practice of the time, Bach would have used such a devotional handbook in connection with his preparation for making confession to his Beichtwater and before and after his participation in communion. Whether he owned Rittmeyer's very popular Himmlische Freudenmal remains an open question. But what is clear is that these various series of emblematic images of Jesus in the heart are in a sense the visual representation of the verbal imagery found in the libretti of Bach's cantatas. Thank you so much, Robin. That's absolutely gripping and marvelous to have those pictures that we can look at uh, at leisure and have a, have a study. I'm going to hand over now to Michael and Noel for some immediate reactions to this. Wonderful stuff. <laughs> yeah, it, make, it put me very much in mind, as I'm sure it did, does you too, of these wonderful places like in the Matthew Passion where the <laughs> The bass sings, uh, Mache dich mein Herz rein, make my heart pure so that Jesus can be buried in there. And also in the closing chorus of the Mark Passion, the same kind of idea is there. So the, what it means to be buried in the heart then is, I guess, for to take in the physical Jesus in the, in the consecrated bread and wine of communion, right? Isn't that what the idea of Jesus living in the heart is part of the metaphor for that? Is that yeah. right, Robin? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. This was um, fascinating. And I appreciate you bringing in visual art to, um, to, to join the conversation about theological, theological aspects uh, related to, to Bach and his context, um, which we usually talk about with words and um, hear a lot of music about it as well. So that's fascinating. 
um, I don't think I've seen so many pictures of Jesus and heart brought together before. Um, in images of Jesus, I've you know I've seen so much of Jesus and in his crucifixion or resurrection. Um, but this is really fascinating because the, the language is familiar, um, but I've never encountered so many pictures like that. So thank you. It also, it also shows how complicated uh, life was uh, at, at all different levels. We tend to think of, oh, yeah, the cantatas, they fit in here in, in, in the Hub Goddess Deans on Sunday mornings, and that's it. No, it, the, their way of life was very complicated and very regimented in many respects. What I also like is how informal some of them are, like the idea that Jesus goes in there and sweeps out the place and so on. You know, it's not the what we tend to think of as Jesus yeah, being this very yeah. serious kind of guy, but here he's like, you know, doing cleaning your apartment for you, you know. Very nice. The the sequence uh, of the Ritma is very carefully done. Uh, you start with the, with the key one. The key one is Jesus is knocking on the door. Nothing is going to happen. <laughs> until you open the door and therefore the rest of them uh th th this shows you what jesus will do once the door is open yeah Lovely. well we're going to come back at the end to some of that to one of these images but now let's move on to hear what noel has to say um, about jesus as treasure thank you so as we have already seen, uh, in, in Bach's liturgical setting, Jesus was clearly more than a historical figure. Throughout the text of Bach's church music, one finds an abundance of symbolic names for Jesus, which point to the importance of his persona on a theological level. These poetic descriptors are then, in turn, elaborated by Luther and by other Lutheran theologians from the 16th to 18th centuries. Jesus, of course, is a central component in the Lutheran understanding of salvation, which is believed to be attained through Christ alone, meaning that Jesus is the one and only pathway to God, salvation, and eternal life. Therefore, it's no wonder that language could hardly do justice to the spiritual significance of Jesus for Lutheran believers. Bach's cantatas are simply overflowing with diverse descriptors for Jesus. For example, in the text of the fourth part of Bach's Christmas oratorio, the name Jesus appears 17 times in the seven short movements, and he is portrayed with some 20 different descriptive words. Hmm. A short excerpt from the second recitative reads in an English translation as follows. Jesus, my joy and gladness, my hope, treasure and portion, my redemption, ornament and salvation, shepherd and king, light and sun. Of these many possibilities, I would like to briefly highlight the idea of Jesus as treasure. The word treasure, or in German, Schatz, appears some 26 times in Bach's sacred music, and of these, 15 refer specifically to Jesus. For example, in Bach's Christmas cantata, 197a, Ehe sei Gott in der Höhe, stanza four reads of the divine infant, O oh, you delightful treasure, rise out of your crib, take place instead on my lips and in my heart. The meaning of Jesus as treasure in this context is lab elaborated in theological books that were present in Bach's own personal library. Johann Olearius in his Bible commentary describes the infant Jesus as the treasure above all treasures and the highest good. Heinrich Müller likewise stated, for among all the treasures of God, there is no more precious and costly gift than the treasure of his grace that is found in Christ. So this and other Christmas, cantata, Christmas cantatas allude to 2 Corinthians 8, 9, which states that Christ became poor so that believers through his poverty might become rich. In contemporary Bible commentaries on this verse and in other passages, baby Jesus is often described as a treasure. And this contrasts with the state of poverty into which he entered the world. August Pfeiffer, for, for example, described Jesus as a dear child lying so miserably like a pearl on a dunghill. On 2 Corinthians 8, 9, the Kellogg Bible comments that in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, indeed the whole fullness of the deity. And the commentary by Olearius on the same verse explains that the treasure is called grace, but in particular, the poverty of the humiliated Lord whereby he has acquired everything for us and encourages us to follow him with good works. In conclusion, Jesus was described as a treasure, 
because the historical events of his birth, crucifixion, and resurrection would have made salvation possible. But he was also considered a treasure in the present moment for all those who would receive him into their hearts. The symbol of Jesus as treasure in Bach's church compositions, and we may assume for Bach himself, therefore carried a deeply personal and spiritual importance for Lutheran believers. Thank you, Noel. That's wonderful. It follows on beautifully from what Robin was saying. Um, Robin and Michael, any responses? Yeah, I'm kind of wondering, do any of those Lutheran theologians and so on talk about the fact that um, because people are uh, permitted, as it were, to use the do form with God, the, that German expression, mein Schatz, is also a kind of very informal thing like, you know, my girlfriend or my boyfriend, very, 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 very informal. Is there a sense of that aspect of shots also, or is that, is that a later thing, or has that come up at all? I don't remember running across it before, but maybe you have. Well, I think it's hard to, to fully understand the nuances of the language at the time and what, how people would position them themselves to God. Definitely, there's a very personal relationship there. Um, uh, if, if that can, you know, in other words, that we would in English translate as beloved or um, right. lover or, you know, things that words that would be closer to what you're saying um, are also used. Um, that's a great a great question and something that I'll pay more attention to in the future. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if maybe maybe Robin has something more here. I'm not uh, sure. I would say that, 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 that undoubtedly there is a, there is this 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 intimacy with with Jesus uh, that is on a par with the intimacy that you have with family, friends, uh, and so on. Uh, yeah, I would just add also that that that. Um, uh, the hymnals, the, the, the hymns uh, that through, take us through, through the, the church year, uh, the, the whole of the church year is th through, uh, you go through the di different parts of the, the, the important parts of the life uh, of Jesus. But even though they do that, there is always a separate section of the, uh, or nearly always, uh, a, a separate section of Ye uh, Jesus' leader. Uh, where if we 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 haven't we haven't have en enough of of, of uh, praising Jesus and <laughs> so we have to have a se separate section as well, which is interesting I think. Yeah. Right, and on this, you know, there's also the image of um, the, a marriage between the church and Jesus, and so yeah. um, Jesus is, is called the bridegroom in some instances, and the church is called the bride, and so that that's you know on a more collective level, um, there is that image of a relationship as as a representation for the relationship of Jesus and the church. Yeah. Thank you. Well, now um, let's hear from Michael uh, on his contribution, Jesus in time and eternity. So a kind of interesting biographical fact that only occurred to me recently because of this thing that we're doing together is that the very first word that was uttered from Bach's cantatas in Leipzig was Jesus. <laughs> cantata 22 was the cantata that he used as two of his cantatas for his uh, audition in Leipzig. And there it is, Jesus nannte sich die Zwölfe. That mm -hmm. was the cantata that was performed before the sermon on that occasion. And then after the sermon, uh, cantata 23 was performed, and that's what I want to spend my just uh, several minutes on. And what I'd like to sort of suggest is that you have an extraordinary situation in Cantata 23 where cantata, uh, the restative, the second movement of this cantata, acts like what you might sort of think of as a sonic emblem to tie it to the kind of things that uh, Robin was doing. Uh, so in order to understand what's going on in that second movement, we need just a little bit of the text from the first movement. It has a slightly strange opening observation. Jesus, you true, son, true God and son of David, you who in the distance from eternity already were looking at the suffering that I'm having, have mercy on me. So we're going to focus a little bit on different notions of time and eternity in this uh, second movement. So let's listen to just the first 20 seconds or so of this extraordinary restative. So 
So what the singer was saying was, ah, Jesus, don't pass by without saving me. He's quoting from a story that appears in several different versions in the New Testament of a blind man who asked Jesus not to pass by him as he's on his way to his crucifixion. He wants to be healed of his blindness. So what you've probably heard right away is that uh, it's very powerful singing on the part of the tenor, but there's this really otherworldly kind of accompaniment coming from the instruments. And that is very interesting because if we circle around the notes that are just on that top line there, you will see that those are in fact pitch for pitch the notes of the famous Lutheran hymn, Christe du Lam Gottes. Extraordinary. All right, so why would Bach do that? Well, let's hear what the hymn sounds like by itself first. Here is a page from one of the Leipzig liturgical books, and I'll do just the first couple of lines of the hymn. And there's the text of it, Christ Jesus, you Lamb of God, you who bear the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Now, the interesting thing is that even when I've played that for very seasoned Lutheran church musicians, they don't necessarily hear the hymn right away. And what I'm suggesting to you is that that otherworldly accompaniment is going to end up embodying two kinds of eternity. The first of the kinds of eternity that is embodied is by quoting that hymn in a way that you don't even notice it at first, because what it's representing as a sonic emblem is what Luther, Luther and Lutherans called the visible, or sorry, the invisible church as opposed to the visible church. The visible church is just everyone who attends in the building and so on. And the true church is the invisible one that constitutes the communion of all saints who are actually saved, which is what this cantata is about, of course. So that's one kind of eternity in Lutheranism where something has a beginning, but it has no end. And that's what that hymn represents there as part of the eternity of that's contrasting with the time of what the singer is singing. Then at the end of this recitative, and that's what I'll close with, the singer, now this time I'll give you the words first and then play the music. The singer sings, I compose myself and will not let you go, Jesus, without receiving your blessing. And that's, a very, that's quoting a very, very famous passage from uh, Genesis 32, the foundation story of Israel in which Jacob wrestles with a man or angel, it's a little unclear who he is. And at the end of the night, the, the, that entity says, let me go. And J Jacob answers, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And then Jacob realizes, oh my God, I've seen God face to face and I've survived here. This, and Luther was very excited about the idea that that God that Jacob wrestled with was actually God's Messiah, the divine, divine son. In Luther's extreme Christocentrism, that was a manifestation of Jesus, or the second person of the Trinity, coming out of the other kind of eternity into time. That is to say, the kind of eternity that is timeless, where everything is but is one permanent now, such that God experiences the past, the present, and the future as all simultaneously. So there, this in this instance, then, um, Jesus is coming out of eternity into history, even before he becomes Jesus of Nazareth and dies on the cross. And this same idea comes up in the Bach Motetti Klasedichnicht, which is word for word, Genesis 32, verse 26. He said it throws in the word my, my Jesus in there to show that it was completely understood by Lutherans that when you say, I will not let you go unless you bless me, that Jacob's referring to Jesus. And only Luther thought, or Luther's one of the only people who really thought that, but it's important for understanding the Bach vocal works to realize that that's the understanding. So here's the final part of the piece then. Um, uh, uh, now with, I put the words of the, the hymn in there. And what I wanna set up for you then is that once again, you have the contrast between the time and eternity, but the last note of the hymn is harmonized inconclusively such that the resolution comes from the eternal parts of the eternity. So the, yeah. the, 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 these various questions that are being asked of God in eternity are in fact answered by musically, not textually, by the ensemble saying 5-1, that is to say, yes. <laughs> So 
So the idea is that those little melodic ideas that's once in a while come in in the recitative, those are examples of eternity breaking into time by giving the answer that you're looking for. And so I see Cantata 23 not just as a artistic manifesto, as often said about Bach's um, audition piece, but also as a sort of religion. It's a religious musical manifesto. This is what music can do. Music can do things that words alone can't. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, thank you, Michael. So, briefly, with Noel, any, uh, how do we take the conversation forward from this? I think Michael is is onto something here. This 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 dialectic uh, between uh, Zeit and Ewigkeit uh, that that is a, that is a constant thing. And one one of uh, I think it was the the archdeacon uh, of the time, but uh, um, uh, Martin Geyer That's right. Um, uh, uh, preached a an annual cycle. Of, uh, of of uh, sermons uh, on Zeit and Avikite, and they're structured exactly like that. Every one of them. Right, yeah. <laughs> this is it in time, and then the second part, this is it in eternity. Every, <laughs> every one. Uh, so, so, so this, this is, as I say, it's a dialectic that, 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 that you come across very frequently in, in Lutheran writings, yeah. Yeah, it's very hard to capture in music, though, right? I mean, so that's what I think is such well, genius right. about this cantata is that he yeah. Bach found a way to translate that, so to speak, which I think is amazing. Yeah. And the Christi Dulangotta's melody um, is very interesting. That 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 some of the hymnals don't even include the text or the um, a, a time, and that in, in, indicates. That um, uh, in fact we, we're not sure where where it, it comes from. We know it's from Luther, Luther's version of the Annus Day, but yeah, it, it, it's it's um, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it's timeless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Time is moving. Um, yeah. We could um, complete our discussion by looking more closely at uh, one of Bach's liturgical cantatas, the three of you together. Robin, I think you have more to say about one of your emblem images and how it relates to cantata 61. Well, I would just point out that the, um, uh, the, the first uh, emblem in the Ritmar is, um, uh, yeah, here it is, um, Jesus knocking on the door. And above, uh, above the the verse above is behold in Revelation three twenty. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any of you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. So it has a Eucharistic uh, connection there. Um, this is the libretto of movement four of uh, Cantata sixty one, the uh, Advent Cantata uh, with the libretto by Neumeister. Mm -hmm. Um, um, but the next movement, movement five uh, of Cantata 61, uh, is, in a sense, is referring to this kind of imagery that, that is here, which reads, open my whole heart, Jesus comes and moves in. And there are other connections like this that, that you're going to find um, in, in the cantatas where there is a, there is a visual uh, as well as a, 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 a verbal uh, image. I think it's interesting. Um, thank you for this, this um, again, a visual of bringing the two together. Um, and I think it's interesting that in the Kalaf Bible on Revelations 3.20, um, the commentary also clearly indicates that this door is a door to the heart and that the heart through faith becomes a dwelling place for Jesus. And yeah. so um, there we see again the, the sort of the, the image kind of imposed on this verse of the heart and that this is um, this signifies indwelling a human heart. And then also the, I mean, not in this context, but throughout the cantatas and, and literature, then we see the opposite of letting Jesus into the heart. And that would be, of course, letting 
evil into the heart or all all manner of um of the opposite of jesus or sin or material rather than the the spiritual uh so that's the, the whole image of a heart of the heart it seems to be so central and uh, important Right. Hence the the emblem of Jesus with sweeping out all the, these <laughs> evil things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, another aspect of this that you made me think then about is I think we can make sense out of what happens at the end of Cantata 61 too, because there's much discussion about why the, the chorale that closes that cantata is supposedly mangled, some Bach scholars said, because they sing only the second half of the stanza and it starts with the word amen amen come you beautiful crown of joy and what people don't i think they don't realize is that just a few verses before in uh revelation 3 i think it's verse 14 or so in there just before the part that's in the emblem uh, jesus is referred to as the personification of amen so so here the idea then is that the closing movement of this cantata the amen amen is not just a uh, affirmation of everything but it's also an invocation to come through the door. That's the way I would hear it. Yeah. Wow. Well, all I can say is, is that's a perfect way to conclude. It's a very unified discussion. Thank you so much, Robin, Noel, Michael. It was wonderful. Thank you for these presentations and, I mean, for fueling this discussion with all these new and stimulating ideas. And thank you for engaging with this topic whether you're watching, listening, or reading. On our Discussing Bach webpage, you will find a full authorized transcript, short biographies of our speakers, a list of further reading and listening, and much more. Thank you. <laughs>